Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here for the India Strategy Session. It is my pleasure to welcome on the stage and on this panel two ministers representing the government of India, the Commerce Minister, Mr. Piyush Goyal. Thank you very much for joining us. And the Oil and Gas Minister, Mr. Hardeep Puri. Thank you very much, Mr. Puri, for joining us. Representing industry is the President of the Confederation of Indian Industry, Sanjeev Bajaj. Sanjeev, always a pleasure. Let me lay out the context for uh, what we intend to take forward in this discussion. Uh, at this point in time, India at a relative advantage. Growth for the year for FY23 forecast by the Reserve Bank of India stands at 7.2 percent. We've had a good run in terms of export, a record number. We've had a good run in terms of foreign direct investment, again a record number. Uh, and of course at this point uh, forex reserves continue to be the cushion and provide us with the comfort that is much needed in the volatile times that we live in. But these are volatile times and there are challenges that the global economy is faced with, and of course, India cannot be insulated from those challenges. So there are near-term issues to be addressed. There are medium and long-term issues to be addressed as well as we celebrate our 75th year. Uh, so that's the context that we intend to take forward here in this conversation. So Minister Goyal, let me start by asking you, let's address the short term at this point in time. As I said, uh, there are significant challenges. The horizon looks cloudy at this point in time. There is, of course, the Russia-Ukraine situation that's playing out. There is what's happening with China and its move towards more protectionism and becoming more insular and the impact of that on global growth and the global economy. The response will have to be a combination of fiscal and monetary measures. The RBI has acted. The government has also acted over the weekend. Significant decisions being taken by the government to bring down excise duties, to provide relief, uh, to also alleviate some of the pain that industry is facing. Uh, is this the first installment of the fiscal measures and is more expected? Thank you, Shireen. And, uh, well, obviously, challenges are there. Challenges will continue to remain. And all of the business world clearly understands that if there were no challenges, everybody would be a billionaire. We in government recognize that if there were no difficulties, we wouldn't be in government. There would be no need for government. So we are very conscious that that's something we have to sort out. Uh, no business, no government can remain constant, they have to evolve with changing times. And I think uh, the government has demonstrated its ability and its agility to move with the situation. As you rightly mentioned, a number of steps been taken uh, over the weekend. Wherever the need arises, we are ready and open to look at what support is uh, necessary for businesses to sustain, to continue to grow, Infrastructure has been a focus area of this government because we believe we have to prepare India for the long run. So you'll find most of the changes in the first round largely focused to ensure orderly growth of the infrastructure sector, housing, roads, all the industries which uh, are dependent on infrastructure growing also stand to benefit significantly. The small-scale sector, the export sector stands to gain significantly from the measures announced. And I think the Reserve Bank had also given clear indication that should the government come up proactively with certain measures, then it will help Reserve Bank uh, refrain from too much of a policy action which could hurt India's growth. So I'm sure Reserve Bank is watching. Reserve Bank, I think, should be happy with the steps the government has taken. And hopefully this will resonate well in terms of continuing the growth momentum and not taking too many steps on the monetary side, which could, uh, which may not necessarily be in the best interest of business in the long run. Yes, you're right in pointing that out. And of course, uh, the RBI governor in his conversation with CNBC TV 18 just yesterday said that they are going to be watching the situation as it develops closely and take a call on further rate hikes. Mr. Puri, one of the key challenges uh, in this already complex mix is what we are seeing as far as energy prices are concerned. Crude at $110 a barrel and holding at that, that is one of the big risks that we are faced with. You can't do anything about crude prices. Uh, you've tried to do what you can as far as excise duties are concerned. Uh, what's the expectation now, not in terms of prices, but the levers you can deploy if we continue to see prices hold at these levels? It, what next, what more can you do? We are very much a part of the international community. And for a country which uh, imports 85% of its requirement of uh, crude, 
and 50% or thereabouts of gas. Clearly, global prices uh, have a major uh, impact. I mean, how do you calculate price at the bunk? You take the global price, you take the cost of insurance and freight, you factor in the exchange rate, which again um, uh, is not insignificant, and then you look at refining margins, etc., and you work that out. But I think the good news is, and that's something which um, India can be justifiably um, proud of and state up front. It's not a one-time measure which we took on a set of measures on the 21st of May. Uh, I think the Prime Minister has demonstrated time and time again that the government, and he particularly, personally, is responsive to the needs of the people. There is sensitivity. Now, you could have argued, as some of my friends did argue, that if your month-on-month -month petrol consumption increases by 15%, then, you know, it's not having an impact on the consumer. But that's not the story. If you're driving an 18 lakh co car costing 18 lakhs, which is the most popular selling model, that's why I'm, I'm not going to name it, otherwise say I'm commercially promoting it. But <laughs> the issue is cost of petrol or diesel doesn't make a difference to that person. But it makes a difference to somebody who has a fixed income, etc. So the prime minister cut exercise, excise on petrol and diesel on 4th May, 5 rupees and uh, 10 rupees on petrol and diesel, respectively, and again, 8 rupees and 6 rupees. So the government is stepping up. Government is doing, and as Piyushji said, large number of other measures taken. Now, what is going to happen to international prices? I'm sorry if I sound a little uh, stark, but oil prices at $110 a barrel, that's not sustainable. And... The fact that that is not sustainable is being seen in countries around India. Uh, you see the dire straits that they're in. It's being seen in Africa, in Latin America. Now, I am, it's everybody's sovereign decision how much of energy you want to put out into the market because the amount of energy you put out and if there's an equilibrium between demand and supply, the price will be determined. But I think everyone should look at the fact that this is an existential threat. Yes. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping, uh, we'll use, PUSG will use his margin of persuasion in every bilateral meeting, the feedback I'm getting. He's saying it. I'm not um, shying away from telling people <laughs> what the consequences are. Hopefully, hopefully that once that realization dawns, that you're not looking at just inflation mm. in the lead economy of the world, $20 trillion economy, highest rates of inflation in 50 years. Uh, one of the other countries which we are used to, long historical association, yes. steepest decline in living standards since the Second World War. That is what makes, in many ways, the India story more remarkable. Mm. That in spite of that integrated global scenario, we are taking the measures, the Prime Minister has taken the measures, in order to make sure how best we can insulate or build in some safeguards. <laughs> can I just yes, supplement yes, one? Yes, please. My last meeting before I came here was with the OPEC member also. I think they are now, and I hope they do realize, recognizing that beyond a stage, this is counterproductive. For example, India is converting even this crisis into an opportunity. We had a plan to blend 20% of fuel. petrol by 2030 yeah. with ethanol. Two weeks ago, Minister Puri has advanced that target by five years. Yeah. So we're going to be 20% uh, blending of uh, petrol by 2025, 20, 26. We're also looking at flexi fuels going right up to 100% ethanol driven vehicles. Now, all of that is good for India in the long run. We are suffering in the short run. But we are making use of this opportunity to transit. That will help also our farmers. Mm -hmm. So our farmers will get nearly $10 billion worth of additional income with ethanol taking center stage. Similarly, electric vehicles. There was a time when people were vacillating how the speed with which the world will transition. I think this time around when the water level reaches right up to your nose, even when the prices come down, people will be unforgetting of what the suffering was. And my own sense is electric vehicles is going to now grow rapidly in the years to come. So I think the OPEC members or the oil producing companies may enjoy a short term gain, but it will lead to a long term fall in their demand and their prosperity.
Well, uh, hopefully oil producers are taking note of that. But Sanjeev Bajaj, let me ask you, uh, you know, so far the mood in industry has been that demand is holding up. Uh, investments will be made. There is the start in the pickup as far as CapEx is concerned. And in light of the additional measures announced by the government, some additional relief has been provided. What's the sense that you get? Plans continue to be on track. Plans continue to roll out and move forward. Shireen, as you said, the last couple of quarters, we've started seeing growth come back, at least consumer growth very clearly. We're seeing this on the ground. And as you mentioned again, quite a few sectors, not just commodities, but chemicals, look at real estate, housing, um, logistics. We are seeing investment already down that cycle. As CII, we did a survey with our uh, top few hundred members a couple of months ago, and 50% of them were already in an investment cycle, and an additional 25% were going to make it in the next quarter or two. Now, maybe that gets delayed by another quarter or two because we know externalities have changed to some extent. But the good thing is that, in general, industry is over 70% on capacity, which means uh, they're ready for the next investment cycle. And with a certain amount of certainty, inflation, I think, needs to be tackled. Mm. Now, we know that to the common man, in addition to fuel, we've talked about it, the other is food, food inflation. Hopefully, we are hearing it's going to be a good monsoon, which means food inflation should be behind us. We should see the domestic uh, uh, demand churning, and that should help in the coming quarters. Mr. Coyle, if I can address the food issue, we just talked about fuel inflation, but if we can address the issue of food inflation as well in the short term, given the disruption that we're seeing on account of Russia and Ukraine, uh, and most countries are resorting to taking measures, including what we have done. Uh, do you believe that for now, what has been done is it, or do you believe that more needs to be done? First of all, I would like to mention, for the benefit of those who are not fully aware of the wheat situation, India never, ever was a traditional player in the international wheat market. Until two years ago, we did not even export wheat from India. Two years ago, we started with a modest 2 million tons of wheat export. Last year, we did about 7 million tons. Basically, this was a little surplus that we found uh, available and that got sold. Even within that, it was largely in the last two months after the war situation developed between Ukraine and Russia. This year around, we were expecting our production to grow by about 7 or 8 percent. Sadly, we had a very severe heat wave in most parts of North India. Wheat uh, had to be harvested early, and we've lost production. Initial estimates are we'd be down 7, 8 percent. By the time we get the final figures, it could be slightly more. Given that situation, what we are producing is about enough to pre for our domestic consumption. With a slight surplus, a lot of which has already been exported, we'll continue to uh, allow exports for, for governments which are in serious need, which are uh, very friendly to us, where we have very great relations. We recognize the letter of credits, the genuine ones which have already been opened. Those will be allowed. So we'll. We'll be a player, we'll be doing to the best uh, of our ability, we'll continue to export. As regards overall food inflation, it's still very much in manageable level. Rice has not seen any significant inflation. Wheat has seen some inflation, but it's not as yet uh, very disturbing. Fruits, vegetables, for example, tomatoes, every year in this month, they go up. But they have not gone up as much as they went up last year, and now they started coming down. Onion and potatoes, which are two sensitive items, our production this year is expected to be good. Indications are all right. Prices are, in fact, on the lower end of the scale. So my own sense is that uh, the packaged food industry, they may make a little buck or two extra because there are some people willing to pay for it. But at the lower end, the common man will not feel the pain of food inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Puri, let's move away from the impact on account of the Russia-Ukraine war to talk about one of the other issues that is being discussed here in Davos, and that's what's happening with China and what's happening in China and the move towards more protectionism, uh, tighter regulations and so on and so forth. Uh, and the opportunity that the 
realignments uh, globally as well as the supply chain de-risking strategy that companies and CEOs are at this point in time looking at, the opportunity that that presents for India. I mean, even at the last Davos, China plus one and what that could mean for India was spoken of. I just finished a conversation with the global CEO of Eva and he said that as CEOs and companies start to make these decisions, they're either going to look at the home country advantage or they're going to look at uh, countries that geopolitically have friendly rela relationships with the countries that they're headquartered in. So he, he called it friend shoring. We're very well aware of offshoring, but friend shoring, is that going to dictate how uh, supply chain realignment will take place? And how do you uh, expect India to capitalize on that? Uh, first of all, let me uh, reinforce what Piyush was saying earlier about challenges also offering opportunities. And I think what you see clearly in evidence is that many of these challenges have resulted in India seizing the opportunity. The healthcare se sector is a case in point. The vaccine story is a case in point. I mean, vaccine production in the public sector had been dismantled between 2004 and 14. I'm not making a political point. We rose to the occasion and 2 billion doses of vaccines administered to our people virtually gratis, free of cost. That's a very significant contribution to the global effort. I have a slightly longer term perspective on what's happening in China or elsewhere. The current order that we are part of was set in the aftermath of the Second World War. The San Francisco conference where the United Nations came into being, the Bretton Woods institutions, the fund, the bank, general agreement on tariffs and trade, which became the WTO. I think what the pandemic demonstrated, unlike H1N1, SARS, Ebola earlier, SARS had a much higher yes. mortality rate. But what this has uh, demonstrated as, I think PUSG was the first to remind me, this looks like the 1918 thing. That is when it started. I'm talking about March uh, 2020 when we had our first discussion. But today, that global order has been challenged. The very fact that the United Nations system or anyone else have not been able to utilize their existing instruments to enforce a cessation of hostilities on um, the situation in one part of the world, I'm talking about China, uh, Ukraine, Russia. What's happening inside China, I mean, the information out in the public domain indicates that there is a problem. I'm not going to make a comment. Does that have something to do with the efficacy of the vaccines they produce? There are other issues. You know, when the genesis, when the whole problem started, we realized what's happening. There was not just a disruption of supply chains, but some of us had to reinvent ourselves. And I think, as I heard some of my colleagues say, you are now re-establishing those relations amongst people who feel a certain sense of confidence and trust in one another. Mm who are able to know this term you used just now. Uh, Friend-shoring. Yeah, fair, <laughs> fair enough. I think you, you know, you store um, uh, this thing, friendship and trust. I think that's it. No matter what happens, the current, there are multiple crises that the world is confronting. The energy crisis is one we spoke about. That has an impact on the possible food inflation. Luckily, in India, we've insulated ourselves. We've taken a large number of measures hmm. to... Uh, make take care of our concerns. But these crises, individual crises, would reinforce each other. And in this process, you will look at a pre-COVID and a post-COVID period. Mm. I know it's very uh, tempting, but sometimes misleading to do that. But the world which is now coming into being will be characterized with international avenues of cooperation very different from the Second World War I. And in that, I think India is playing a role. India will determine the Prime Minister's personal reach out. I'm not only just talking about Quad. Mm. I mean, he was in Europe recently. Yeah. He was... Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very vigorous and sustained positioning of India to take charge and take advantage of those opportunities. Mm. What will happen to this? You will be start contributing. I mean, I can give you a number of areas. Active pharmaceutical ingredients is one. How we went into <coughs> the whole healthcare, the oxygen plants, etc. And I think that is what has helped. And yes, look, uh, we wish well to all 
uh, economy is large and small. But if something goes wrong in a very large economy, it has reverberations yes. uh, elsewhere. And we'll have to uh, build in safeguards to make sure that the impact on us and uh, for people that we care, uh, we are sufficiently insulated against those uh, disruptions. Mm -hmm. Sanjeev, let me uh, take that forward with you. In terms of uh, what we are seeing, a change in the geopolitical alignments, a change in the geopolitical framework. Uh, marry that with the decisions already taken uh, by the government to open up sectors. Uh, I think FDI caps across sectors have been relaxed and that's been a process uh, that we've seen happen. Uh, there have been several sectoral schemes being announced, PLI schemes, uh, 15 of them, a semiconductor policy now put in place as well. Uh, so we've seen very significant FDI flows coming in. Given this current context, do you believe we will continue to build on that? What's the sense you get when you speak with your counterparts globally? So, Shireen, uh, this session, that's why it's as much about India at 75 as it is about India beyond 75. Right? The Amrit Kal that our Prime Minister talks about, the next 25 years, how do we prepare for that? So, uh, one, the FTAs that Minister Piyush is working on and two that are already signed, is opening up new avenues for growth. Second, we know geopolitics is creating this friendly sourcing, secure sourcing, opportunity and need. India can stand up to that. The 13 plus one sectors with the PLI support, which is a kickstart to manufacturing in key sectors to build not only capacity, but capability. And very clearly, you cannot do it in hundreds of sectors. You can yes. do it in certain key sectors. That's happening. The national infrastructure pipeline, the monetization fund, all of these are furthering infrastructure, not only employment, not only GDP growth rate, but also will improve ease of doing business. Ease of doing business itself, I know SCI, we've taken a whole bunch of representations to the government to improve or change regulations, that's happening, and they're saying come back with more. All of this has to continue happening, because it's not, we've not reached, there's no end goal, it's a process. We have to be on that road, all this put together should definitely create the next few decades of opportunity for India. Well, speaking of the next few decades of opportunity, the aspiration of the $5 trillion economy, uh, Minister Goel, uh, the expectation now is that we'll get to that in FY27, given what we've had to go through on account of the pandemic, etc. Uh, but linked very closely to that is the aspiration on the export front. We've had a good year uh, on exports. It's been a record number that's been delivered. What will be the focus areas as far as exports are concerned? Uh, you know, where do you believe India will be able to use its competitive advantage, its competitive strength to drive the export uh, target. And you've, you've held out a very ambitious target of getting to a trillion dollars uh, in merchandise export by 2030 and a trillion dollars in services exports by 2030 as well. What will be the roadmap, the drivers for export growth from here on? You know, when you drill down these targets or the mission that we set out to do, you find that it's not at all difficult. I'll give you a case in point, the textile sector. We're doing about 42 billion we did last year. It's a sector which was traditionally our very own. India was known for the textile sector. When I talk to the textile industry, their problems are not too many. There's certainly a major issue with the import duties that are charged to Indian goods in EU and uh, UK and other countries, where we did not have an FTA so far or no discussions were happening. And they are large markets which we are trying to resolve. So Vietnam and Bangladesh, Vietnam for the FTA, Bangladesh being a less developed country, got an edge over our exporters. Many ways we could not create scale. Often the textile industry had a problem that we didn't have a cluster-based approach. So we had cotton in another region, spinning in another, and then this uh, material would come back to a third region for fabricating or whatever, garment, garment making. We are trying to right-size all these small concerns and issues which are flagged off with us. Seven mega textile parks are coming up under PM Mitra scheme. When each of these issues are being addressed in consultation with the industry, and then when I talk to them that what kind of targets can we come up with, they tell us that we can do $100 billion by 2030. We don't have to tell them. The, the bottom-up approach I spoke about in the morning. I think every sector, when we are talking to them, earlier in the day I was talking to the steel industry, the aggressive expansion plans that they have, the way they want to become a dominant player in the world markets. 
despite our putting in an export restriction to cool down prices and ensure availability of steel for our MSME sector, our engineering uh, exporters, our engineering uh, auto component manufacturers and stuff like that. They are very bullish. They are very confident about the future. They recognize that we have also addressed their concerns about input pricing. And a very balanced approach has been taken vis-a-vis -vis the growth of that sector. They are looking at expanding their exports from a current level of about 20 million tons to nothing less than 60, 70 million tons. That's the spirit in which we are engaging with each sector. Gem and jewelry. Uh, just before leaving for Davos, I had a presentation from lab-grown uh, diamonds. Lab-grown diamonds are growing at about 30% a year. But they say we can do much faster growth. We are currently about $600, $700 million of export. They are targeting $10 billion, only lab-grown diamonds in the next five years. Now, the, these, are, these are jewels in our crown, small issues which we didn't recognize for so many years, technical textiles. We have just not understood that the world has moved two-thirds of the world trade of a hundred uh, of a trillion dollars is in technical textiles. But we were not a player because we just focused on one segment. Now we are focused on expanding technical textiles to the extent that we are supporting research in technical textiles uh, significantly all across the country. So textiles, leather, sports goods, uh, footwear, uh, gem and jewelry. Our engineering exports, we had targeted 103 billion, went up to 113 billion last year. They are looking at $250 billion at least by 2030. So when you drill it down sector by sector, doesn't look like a very difficult target. Okay. Uh, let me address one of the other sectors that the government is focused on, and industry is looking at that opportunity as well very closely, and that's the transition to uh, clean energy, to green energy, Mr. Puri. Uh, you know, Minister Goyal talked about the ethanol blending uh, timeline being advanced to 2025. Uh, but in the context of the current challenges as well, there is an issue as far as coal is concerned. We are seeing power outages at this point in time. That's the near-term challenge that you need to address as well, even as you make the transition and plan for the long term, which hopefully will be cleaner and greener. Uh, what do you see as the specific challenges uh, as we make this transition? And what do you believe are the imperatives, both from the government point of view as well as from the industry's perspective, to be able to deliver on this? When you said that, uh, let me take you to another sector, I thought you were coming to housing and <laughs> construction. I'll get to that no, also. No, no, I'm, no, no be, I'm, I'm just teasing you. Uh, we've got things, good things are happening there too. Uh, PUSG and I were in a discussion the other day and we were talking about cement, I said people seem to forget that we're constructing between 700 and uh, 900 million square meters of urban space every year, which is equivalent to uh, Chicago or something. I mean, there's a phenomenal uh, construction activity which is going on there. But coming to, and, and the sector is picked up. I mean, inventories are down, yeah. except for a few cases. Demand is up, you know, and I, I'll come to that only if you ask me. But uh, <laughs> Why don't, why, why don't no, I no, ask no. you that now, then, since you've already started? Well, look, <laughs> look, again, again, it starts, it starts with that basic sensitivity. And when the Prime Minister said that it is his dream that by 2022, Every Indian, no matter where he or she lives, should have a roof over their heads. A pakka ghar with a kitchen, a toilet, ujwala, etc., etc. And some of my friends in parliament was getting a little aggressive and I enjoyed, I encouraged them. Kab tak hoga? Ek, one target was one crore. We've already done one crore, 22 lakhs. If you combine that with the target for the rural sector, it's over three crores. Now, we are not just talking numbers. Uh, 70 or 75 lakh uh, uh, of the uh, uh, units have already been handed over to the labartis or the beneficiaries. The others have been grounded. You have to use modern technology. The Prime Minister declared a full year as global technology housing challenge year. We shortlisted 53 technologies. Six of them were invited to participate in um, glasshouse projects where in six cities, 1,000 homes are being constructed using the latest cutting-edge technology within one year. Uh, 
This is the government part of it. Then there is a private sector mm. part of it, which is which much larger. And the Prime Minister wanted that the title of each of those homes should be in the name of the lady of the house. So there is uh, uh, empowerment, there is uh, gender, uh, etc. And what the private sector has done, they're using modern technologies, private sector is stepping in. A phenomenal amount of work is done. Now, what is the importance of the housing sector? PUSG started with textiles and clothing. That's a very big employer. Mm. Agriculture is a very big employer. I mean, if I tabulate all these steps that the government has taken for agriculture in different ways, it adds up what the state governments are doing. Uh, the Honorable Chief Minister, the state governments have done on their own also. Uh, all this is adding up to, and housing and construction, again, contributed to GDP and employment. If you take textiles, housing, and um, agriculture, these are the three major, uh, um, you know, uh, areas which, sectors which provide the employment. You're using green technology. Let me come briefly, because I know you have a time constraint, to the transition. You mentioned uh, biofuel blending. It's not just that we brought the target date from 2030 to 2025 for 20% blending, but 20% blended fuel will become available in our petrol bunks by 1st of April 2023. So we're going to start on that. Then PUC talked about flexi-fuel engines. We're already talking to the manufacturers. Mm. It's something that's happening. The transition to electric vehicles. I yesterday had a meeting with an entrepreneur who's already in touch with Indian companies. He's got patent aluminum air batteries now. This is the kind of cutting edge stuff. And I think India is not only what steps India is taking. If you make the transition to green energy, surely it should be anchored in a country which has large demand and consumption on its own. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think many of these players are coming here. I don't want to sound um, dismissive, but it's one thing for a country with a limited appetite and consumption to be sh shifting to green energy, and another thing for a country like India yeah. to be going in. And green hydrogen, I think. The Prime Minister made it clear that we want to do this in mission mode. There have been a little bit of hiccups here and there on the way, but we are firmly going down that road. Some of our uh, pilot projects have started. I know one of my OMCs has already started producing yep. as part of a pilot project. 2G, second generation ethanol. By uh, between August and December, we would have done 90 million liters of ethanol produced from agricultural waste and uh, uh, bamboos. So the transition will take place, but a word of caution. Transition by definition is moving from the current mm. to that point. We can't afford to get disrupted on the current. Sure. You will have to make sure there's enough energy which has been ensured available to people. Six crore people go to fill up their tanks every day in Delhi. That's in India, sorry. 60 million people, 5 million barrels a day is our consumption. Clearly, we are moving towards um, uh, green energy, mm. but that green energy transition will have to ensure that the present, whilst you introduce more and more green energy, by 10% blending, we saved on those prices then 30,000 crores. Mm. Today's prices being what they are, and we go to 20%, you know what the uh, saving will be. Yes, uh, it makes economic sense, and of course, it makes sense from a climate security perspective as well. But Mr. Goel, let me ask you this, because I would imagine that many in this room are interested to understand what the roadmap looks like. The government has put in place a privatization policy. Uh, no sector has been left out of it. Uh, the legislative changes to enable banks to go the privatization route is still awaited. But uh, we've started with Air India. Uh, that's been done. What do you expect now in terms of uh, forward movement on, on that front? as well as the involvement of both domestic industry as well as foreign industry? I think a very calibrated approach has been taken in consultation with bankers, in consultation with all the stakeholders as far as uh, monetizing assets is concerned. In a few cases, government getting out of the business where it doesn't have any uh, business to be in. And that calibrated approach is the right way to go. There are some people who want everything to be done overnight. That's not the way we are going to have an orderly transition. That's becoming the buzzword of this uh, <laughs> panel. But you can't just overnight move everything from the government sector to the private sector. For example, in a situation like today, 
where a lot of relief is being sought to be given to the common man, particularly in petrol diesel prices. I think our public sector companies are doing phenomenal work yeah. in kind of acting also as a shock absorber mm. and giving relief to the common man. So every industry has a very important and critical role to play. We have to calibrate and gradually move out from the uh, past and sudden changes will only add to the disruption. I think it's moving at a good pace. We've seen LIC happen, which most people were very skeptical about. Air India, nobody believed would happen after maybe 10 or 12 failed attempts. And I think Minister Puri can take pride in the fact that a lot of it, rather all of it happened while he was the civil aviation minister. He only closed the deal uh, after he moved to petroleum. But uh, overall, if you see, the pace at which we are doing it is very, very uh, sensible in terms of the the appetite of the country. We are looking at areas like textiles where we are getting totally out of that business. Government has no business to be trying to sell. Uh, you know, we have, I think in NTC, we have 100 shops, maybe more, I'm just, I don't know, which sell day-to-day uh, -day wear all across South India. Doesn't make sense. In fact, there's a very sad story that's emerging where some of the states are also trying to say that, okay, you privatize in the center and the state will buy it off. I think that loses the very essence of privatization. So we are talking to the states and getting them on board. Our approach is very consultative, very uh, uh, inclusive. We take everybody along. And therefore, you'll see that there's been no stress in any of the actions that the government has, been, has taken. It's all moved smoothly rather than creating a stress and then trying to manage it. You use the word shock absorber in the context of oil marketing companies and because they are uh, sharing a burden uh, with uh, with the government and they do have under recoveries on both petrol and diesel. Given that and given the volatile times that we live in, do you believe that at least in some strategic sectors perhaps a pause on privatization may have to be considered? We haven't gone down that route at all. But by the way, uh, the under recoveries in the short run are made up by a longer term uh, action. So uh, for heaven's sake, nobody gets the message that the oil companies of the government are uh, kind of taking on the losses onto themselves. They are behaving in a very fair and sensible manner. Responsible citizens. As responsible corporate citizens and companies who recognize that in the long run it's smart to be with the customer, keep your customer your own rather than lose them out just for immediate gains. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think uh, that's the kind of response I got from the steel industry. I said it earlier, when I was quite concerned that I'm going to get a lot of pushback or uh, negativity, but I'm, I must compliment India's steel industry. The big players have all been in touch with me in the last two days. All have shown tremendous sense of responsibility and understanding and have uh, supported the government's effort to bring order into the uh, marketplace. I think this, is, this put, uh, gives a very good message. It shows that India works as one. It's Team India that's working for the future of the country. And that's the message uh, that we want to give to all of our friends at Davos. When you invest in India, when you come to India, you are investing in the India story. It's not about one sector. It's not about one government or one uh, set of polit political thinking, whether it's the judiciary or the media, if I may suggest, whether it's business or the common man. We are all working towards a collective better future for the people of India. Right. Sanjeev, since we're talking about the future of India, I know uh, now that you've taken over as the president of CII, you've put together a 10-year roadmap as well in terms of what you would like industry to prioritize. Uh, Cost competitiveness is going to be a big focus area. Competitiveness across states is, of course, something that the government has been working on, and now CII intends to take that forward as well. Uh, so lay out for us the top five issues, areas uh, that industry will prioritize uh, as we move forward towards the 2030 goal. Okay, that's a pretty tough question, and I'm, as you can see, I'm sitting in a very sensitive spot over here. <laughs> but, uh, You're sandwiched. <laughs> I'm sandwiched between two senior ministers. One is industry has to continue to build internal competitiveness so within our factory walls while the government continues to build external competitiveness for the country. So that's something that we need to do. Second, no 
large industrial or no large developed country in the world has developed itself without a strong domestic financial services industry. So we have to see how do we expand that in India. We must attract foreign capital, we must attract them in a transparent, consistent manner, but foreign capital will eventually find the right uh, locations uh, and that can change over a period of time as we have seen in the last few months in India, nothing wrong with that. Domestic capital doesn't do that, so we have to build a strong domestic uh, financial services industry. Third key sectors to focus on that the world can look at, India can look at, where are we going to build capability and capacity? We need to do that. Fourth, skill building. 200 million Indians in the next 10 years will need jobs, but they are also job providers for the world. So work on that. Fifth, entrepreneurism. The initiatives taken by the government on the startup ecosystem, in five years, we've become the third largest startup nation in the world, over 100 unicorns. And, you know, somebody said the other day, no, no, that's surplus liquidity coming in. Okay, so as I said, it's not 100 unicorns, they are 0.6 of a unicorn. But there are 100 global, globally capable businesses set up by 20, 30-year-olds. Yeah. When did this ever happen in India again? So we need to continue focusing there because then, as the Prime Minister said, your job seekers are actually job creators. That's what the new India is showing. And we can't stop. Center and states must work together so that overall, any new business coming in, land, labor, energy, all this gets sorted out. So ease of doing business continues to grow. All this put together should take us out there. I think that's a very comprehensive set of uh, areas that industry intends to focus on and, of course, in partnership with government. I think we're almost at the end of our time. So let me uh, get wrap-up comments from each of you. And, Minister Goyal, I'll start by asking you. Uh, I think you've given us a roadmap of what the government intends to focus on. Let me specifically ask you on the trade and investment side uh, and what you are now looking at from a commerce minister's perspective. Uh, the move towards more bilateral arrangements, uh, you know, there is a fear that could we see more deglobalization and what that could mean in terms of uh, economies going forward. Uh, as you engage with countries uh, bilaterally, as you engage with trading blocks, what do you believe will be the imperatives that will guide us? I think bilaterals will always prevail over multila multilaterals in terms of trading blocks because it's easier to understand each other's sensitivities see what's good for each other uh, in a bilateral arrangement. And my own experience with UAE and Australia, two very important trading partners with huge potential markets for Indian goods and services, is that when you lay out the rules of the game up front, you are sensitive to their concerns, they are sensitive to your concerns, you can actually move really fast. And we saw both these deals happening in under three months of serious negotiations. My own sense is that uh, globalization is not going to go away. Globalization will now mean work amongst, as was said earlier, trusted partners, work amongst democracies, work amongst rule-based economies. And I think that portends well for India, particularly because we are big on transparency, we are big on the rule of law, we are a democracy, a vibrant democracy, with a big set of young, talented people, which the world is looking for. Every company I engage with said the biggest draw to India is the talent that we get. Our R&D grows significantly when we come to India. We love to design in India. So I think uh, our relevance in global supply chains will continue to be strong. Global supply chains may get reoriented but will continue to prevail because, as Ricardo said, every country can't be good in everything. There'll be a comparative advantage amongst nations for different products. And we recognize that. We are not against imports in any way. We believe two-way trade is going to be good for the country, getting us what we need best from other parts and offering the best of India from India. A billion-plus people aspiring for a better quality of life, huge opportunity in India, other countries also recognize it when we discuss trade deals. India will be a $30 trillion economy when most other countries would only have doubled their economic size. And that's the big opportunity India offers to the world. And I think that's the draw that's bringing more and more requests for trading arrangements 
within India. Minister Puri. You know, the uh, figures for foreign direct investment which came in uh, by 31st March, uh, compare that to what happened in 2004, it's a 20 times increase. You're looking at $84 billion and in a difficult period. I have no doubt that the uh, transformational change which is being brought about within the country uh, will result not only in goods and services, you know, Sarvodaya to Antyodaya to the farthest first, you're looking at those sections of society, but there are great economic opportunities. And that economic opportunity which India presents today, whether it is technology companies, uh, you know, people working on green energy, people working in a host of other companies, that will actually accelerate. Now, at any given point of time, um, investors are faced with a choice. I think some of the developments that have taken place since 2020, the choice is narrowing more towards India. And, I mean, we are doing some things right. Mm. That is making India more attractive. The Prime Minister's new India and India at 75 going on to India at 100. I mean, what Piyush is saying about the size of the economy, I, you mentioned 2027 instead of 2025. I would like to have a discussion with you on that separately. <laughs> it's not my forecast, no, sir. No, it's it's not my forecast. forecast. It's the but, IMF's forecast. No, but <laughs> as I said, 9% nine, nine, nine rate of growth. And you know, these uh, figures of where you are getting, I mean, despite the fact that you had a pandemic, you had yeah. lockdowns, etc., you're back to the that 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 resilience, that rebound uh, has shown. I am very uh, confident. I'm as a person, I'm a little optimistic and bullish, which is uh, part of the DNA. But I think the India story today and what you are witnessing here in Davos, in terms of the attention and elsewhere, yeah. you have you whether you it is a fund, the International Monetary Fund's assessments other assessments, it's not that there are no challenges, yeah. but either we have the ability to transform those challenges into opportunities, as PUG said, which is what, what the government is beginning to reinforce mm. each time. I think industry, uh, CII is apex body and under Mr. Bajaj's uh, stewardship and the institution, other members of who are the stakeholders and the government, I think there is a healthy understanding on the need to work if some steps have to be taken uh, in the short run in order to fight inflation, the fact that those are received in the right spirit and everybody is doing, which is something I see conspicuous by its absence in the international system. I mean, if you look at, surely the realization should dawn on everybody that if you have oil prices at $110, it will result in a set of economic consequences in which yeah. even the people who are benefiting in the short run will also have to pay a price because it could impact on that. So I think the India story is a good one. The India story will become even better once these changes are taking place and we navigate out of the uh, uh, pandemic totally. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Minister Goyal, Minister Puri and Sanjeev Bajaj for joining us here to take us through the India strategy session and the outlook for where India uh, finds itself in the short term, as well as our aspirations and objectives of being able to uh, improve on each of these parameters that we've spoken of over the medium to long term. Appreciate your time and thank you very much for joining us here in Davos. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed.